Only Love is Left Alive is about um, two very refined and delicate creatures called Adam and Eve. They, they essentially are reclusive, independent, um, sensitive, sophisticated um, artists, I suppose. And the film is about their coming back together again after some time apart and, um, and musing on, on life and, and the state of the world and art and music and creativity. Did I mention that they were vampires? They're vampires. I sometimes forget to say that, but it isn't really per se. It's not a conventional vampire story. We, we barely bear our fangs in this one and, and we don't sparkle. Um, and we don't speak with Hungarian accents. Jim Jarmusch is uh, he's one of a kind. His understanding of of, um, of history and art and music and literature is is something that he's infused the film with. I think he's always felt an affinity with outsiders, and um, Adam and Eve are outsiders in the, in some regard. Uh, Tilda said something uh, which very which I found very funny, which is uh, she thinks Jim Jarmusch has been making vampire films for years. It's only this time he just decided to show that his his central characters are actually drinking blood. But if you think of Night on Earth and Mystery Train, um, though any of those groups of characters might be vampires in some way. It means the world to me that Only Love is Left Alive will have its um, UK premiere at the London Film Festival. Um, uh, personally, because um, the very first film I was in, uh, Unrelated, directed by Joanna Hogg, um, premiered at the London Film Festival and, uh, and won a, a, an award there. Um, I, I live in London, I was born here. I love the, the London Film Festival. I, I've come every year for the last five or six years and um, I'm very, very proud to, um, to present the film to London in that, on that stage. British actor Tom Hiddleston recently transformed into American country singer Hank Williams. I wanted to hear what it took for him to make this leap into another's life. So, you've taken on this icon, this hero, this massive figure in American cultural history. Mm. How deep was the breath that you draw before doing that? Just, I mean, it's giant. It's, it's, uh, it was terrifying. It was daunting. It was challenging but exciting, because Hank Williams changed the landscape of American music. He inspired so many. Bob Dylan, the Rolling Stones, Johnny Cash, Bruce Springsteen, all tipped their hat to Hank. Basically, he was born with spina bifida, which wasn't diagnosed till he was about 27, but he was, he was quite a, apparently quite a weak child, and, and, and he wasn't strong, and... Um, which is why he missed the draft, so he wasn't a soldier himself. And he also didn't work. He didn't work on the railroad, he didn't work in the field, he didn't work on the farm, which is, I think, part of the reason why he latched on to music and why he latched on to the guitar, because he, that's what he could do. How did you begin to get into this music, which is not your music? No, that was the hardest thing, I think, was trying to, to change my instinctive rhythm. Our British rhythm is actually very on the beat. It's very neat, it's very tidy, it's very British. So how do you unstitch that? Uh, you unstitch it by going to Nashville for six weeks before you start shooting. She changed the lock on our front door and my door key don't fit no more, so get it on over. I went to train with a man. He's actually Nashville royalty and he's called Rodney Crowell. He himself saw Hank Williams play on his father's shoulders at the age of two. And it's one of his earliest memories. And Hank is the biggest inspiration in his life. The thing that he instructed me to do from the get-go was to interpret 
the material, which is really just like playing a Shakespearean role. He said, there's no way you can imitate Hank. Hank was the only Hank. But the way that you'll carry it across, and he used these words, he said, if you can sing with the same level of authenticity, sincerity, and feeling, and show us what that means to you, we'll hear it. We'll hear what Hank was trying to say, because that's, that's the power he had. Is that he, it came from his heart. Hank wouldn't be tamed by the music industry. Famously, he once stormed out of an interview, something musicians simply didn't do at that time. What I loved, I guess, is that Hank has a rebelliousness I don't have. I'm too English and too well brought up, probably. Do you think you will acquire that with age? I don't know. I don't know that I'll ever walk out of an interview. But I love his honesty about it. If there's anything I could say, or you <laughs> Bam! <laughs> I wonder, I think it's because uh, spies are very brave and they choose to live outside the, the normal boundaries of society. Most of us, we have um, free time and we have jobs and we go on holidays and we have intimate relationships and, and, and um, there's nothing to hide, but spies choose to live behind the curtain and beneath the surface um, to protect us and to keep us safe, and I, I think that's why they endure as, as stories. So I read that you were, you were in Curzon Soho watching The Consequence of Love when you got a text message saying that you should go and audition for Joanna's, but unrelated. That's absolutely true. And you were wearing, like, board shorts and thongs. and Absolutely true. And thongs? <laughs> well, Hang so on I, a I, second. I lived in Oz. flip-flops. Oh, flip-flops. Yes, I was. Yeah, yeah. Thongs. I was like, wow. That's <laughs> going into a whole other territory. It was the summer, like, six, five or six years ago. And um, London was just unbearably hot, mm. and it was mid-June. And I'd escaped the heat because uh, I really wanted to see the consequences of love. And I mercifully kept my phone on. And I got the, I just checked it about halfway through. It was my agent saying, you've got to go to BAFTA in 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, um, which is only down the road, obviously, down Shaftesbury Avenue. And I said, I'm not dressed properly. And, 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 and my, my agent said, don't worry about it. Um, just, you know, make your apologies. Little did I know that I'd dressed in Perfectly character, in character. Yeah. Right. So spot yeah. on. No, it was great the way he came in. Actually, completely unprepared, and, and that was much you more that, interesting uh, to me. Did you guys come at it from the same place? Did you have disagreements about how to develop the character, or was he some? Did that kind of develop as you were as you were filming? No, no, very much. We didn't have disagreements, no. and we we had a you know quite a bit of communication over the character because actually when I was after I finished Unrelated, there was a little bit of time where I was working out well, what mm. am I going to do next? I felt a little bit of pressure actually. And I was toying with a few other ideas, and then and then I started to think about setting something in in this location on this island called Tresco in the Isles of Scilly, and then a, about the characters that would people the story, and and um, and sort of quite early on, I knew I wanted to depict a a twenty eight year old young man. I remember a great phone conversation we had sort of early in in two thousand and nine, um, where I was asking Tom, you know, what what is it like? being a 28 year old because you were 28 at yes, the time I was, yeah. and uh, you know just wanting to get under the skin of the character at the yeah. same time i was obviously putting a lot of myself into the character mm. as well so it was kind of throwing all those things up in, in yeah. into the mix and i think you very much you're you you were a part of edward but at the same time he's a he's, he's a construct i'm really interested in him as a character like someone that i kind of i liked a lot someone that you'd like to meet and hang out with but you just sort of want to kick him as well oakley because, sorry no or edward. 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 Yeah, yeah. edward he's got a great heart but he sort of riddled with issues of self-esteem. Because what I was yeah. interested to do was depict a character who was full of doubts about mm. kind of where they'd come from and, and who they were and where they were going, actually. So it was very much about yeah. tapping into that. It's always about somehow finding a part of myself that is relevant and then turning the volume up on that particular yeah. part. So and I, think, I think most actors are like that. I think, you know, I am all the characters I've ever played and I am none of them at the same time. Um, but they're, they're, it's sort of you're just you're just playing with the the dials on your own personality. And one thing that I certainly brought of myself to Edward is um, I've always been concerned with uh, the, the big burning question, you know, in the long dark tea times of my soul, is um, is is what's the most effective use of my time on this planet? What's fantastic about Tom is that he 
as you say correctly, you know, you're sort of turning up the volume on a, on a, a specific aspect of yourself, yeah. but you turn it up so strongly that I believe that he is totally that person. And the same thing with Oakley. I mean, I think people are really amazed how you just, you know, can play so convincingly such different characters. Because Tom Middleton, now one of your, because you, you acted in, in school, but you were in school. Yeah. I mean, how posh is this? You've got to see a school production and Tom Middleton's in it with Eddie Redmayne. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, um, yes. Uh, he was a great talent even then. He was the star, he was a huge star. And we were in um, a school production of A Passage to India by E.M. Forster. <laughs> 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 there must have been some really depressed parents going in to see that. <laughs> a passage to... They're doing a passage to India. <laughs> <laughs> How long was it? I, I have no idea. Oh, Very hours. long, yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, all boys school... Um, they're only halfway. <laughs> um, uh, Eddie, the great Eddie Redmayne, the now uh, Oscar-winning yeah. Eddie Redmayne, was playing the female lead. And uh, in, in the passage to India, there's an there's a expedition to this cultural landmark called the Marabar Caves by elephant. Um, I'm delighted to reveal that I played the front right leg of the elephant that Eddie was running. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and it was four of you to make the elephant. That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he was sitting on you. He's, he's sitting on... We're holding a table <laughs> oh, um, oh. with a cushion on top of it and also a tablecloth to cover our faces. Because we, our bodies are the elephant. Um, yeah, so that's... Um, that Sounds the... awful. <laughs> <laughs> You've just got that picture in your head. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, I imagine just sitting there thinking, I haven't had a drink, we're at school, we're oh. carrying a, some boy dressed as a girl on top of a table. <laughs> and my son's playing the front leg. <laughs> exactly. the front leg. <laughs> I can't even say that's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. Oh, IMDb front <laughs> Hello, it's Tom Hiddleston here, and um, I am just here to um, answer a question from Jory. Um, the question was, um, which of Shakespeare's female characters is my favourite, and why? It's a very, very tough question um, because um, Shakespeare wrote so many amazing women, and I think it's a dead heat between Imogen in Cymbeline and uh, Juliet in Romeo and Juliet. I was just thinking the other day about um, one of the things that Juliet says she, when uh, she's waiting for the morning to come so that she can see Romeo again. And she starts a speech with, gallop apace, you fiery-footed steeds towards Phoebus lodging. Um, when will it be day? Or wh will it not be day? And I think that's wonderful. Uh, she's uh, encouraging the horses who... Um, who lead the, the, the canvas of night across the sun to, uh, to hasten towards um, the home of Phoebus, the sun god, so that the sun will rise. Um, Juliet is one of the most spirited uh, and beautiful, compassionate characters. Um, so I have a very soft spot for her. So there you go, Jory. Imogen and Juliet. This might be the last Marvel carpet for you, like, yeah. ever. Yeah. What do you um, think? Do I think about that? Man, I hadn't thought about that until you told me. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe Tom. No, 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 no. It's okay. I can. I can just. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm just gonna. No, 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 I just no. really miss it, man. And I, um, no. you know, it's been like a really good time. And. You make me cry. But think how far you've come. Your first carpet. You yeah. must have been so nervous, and now you own the place. I don't know if I own the place. <laughs> um, no, it might be the last one, and it's been, it, God, it's been amazing. It's been um, absolutely above and beyond my wildest dreams. Um, I mean, I got cast, I got cast four years ago, what happened was 2013, four years ago, 2009. I came out to LA um, with like, you know, some t some money I'd earned in British TV in my pocket, and I did some auditions, and one of them was for Kenneth Branagh's Thor, and it's being Loki has changed my life. It was amazing. What makes me scared? Probably my own imagination. <laughs> um, but uh, it's funny actually. I, I think I'm scared by. Um, 
and I include myself in this. I'm scared by uh, carelessness. Um, I, I, you know, I think I, I, when I sometimes I read the news and I feel like we're all hurtling towards this uh, future that we're building, and and some and some, we should be more careful. That's what scares me. Um, in case we end up in the wrong place, if that makes any sense.